James 1, verse 2 to 6 states, Consider, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If anyone lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But, but when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. Now the joy, the call for joy in the face of trials and troubles may seem shocking or even insensitive at first read, but if you're willing to take a closer look at this particular scripture, you will discover that James is making it clear that he finds joy in the results of the trials and troubles, not in the trials or troubles themselves. He's not, yeah, he, he's asking you to look beyond them. Even very difficult times can produce qualities such as perseverance and endurance. Life is full of problems, and these problems will definitely test our faith, and they will show the reality of our faith, and if we let them, they can even produce a Christ-likeness in us. Life is full of problems. Trials, troubles, hard time, dark hours, they're inevitable. Even James knows this. When we look at verse 2, you will notice the word when and not if. We can never get away from them. So the question then becomes, what will we do with them? Welcome to Chronicles Ministries and come with me as we look back in scripture in order to be reminded so that we can move forward in hope. Hope, even in the midst of trials and troubles. What kind of trials or troubles are you facing? How are you doing in the midst of them? Are you feeling defeated, defiant, frantic, or desperate? Have you lost heart? Are you questioning God's goodness? Are you grumbling against God, complaining, or even maybe having a good dose of self-pity? Honestly, all these feelings listed above, I get. I felt them, and I've struggled through them. I suspect I'm not alone. I also know that justification can be found in each one of the above listed feelings, but we know nobody will argue that they are not profitable, especially if we stay in them for too long. No matter how hard or unpleasant the trial or trouble that you are going through may be, these feelings, if, stay, if we stay in them, tend to tear us down and not build us up. Now the Greek word endurance describes the quality that enables a person to stay on his or her feet when facing the fierce blowing wind and rain of a storm. And quite frankly, sometimes it's like a hurricane. Can we look at the storms, the troubles we have gone through or facing or are coming at us in the future as from God. Can we look at them and see that there is, is a good purpose in them? Can we see the need to not grow faint or weary, but remain faithful to God and trust in His purposes in them? This is really hard stuff, very hard stuff. James is asking his readers of the letter, and therefore you and I today, to resolve to stay under the heavy load of trials instead of trying to escape them or cut them short. He is telling them and us not to become despondent or discouraged when passing through these difficult times. I don't know about you, but oh to have the wisdom to view the pressures of life from God's standpoint. I myself can't, cannot do trouble on my own. And there it is, verse 5. It states, If anyone lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. This is a promise that you nor I have to face problem, the problems of life in our own wisdom. If we are having trouble with our view of life's hardship, 
If we lack spiritual insight, or even eyesight, we can go to God. He is, he is listening. And if we truly, hear me say that again, if we truly go to him with a desire to find his purpose, he will show us his purpose through his eyes, and we will be greatly rewarded. He gives to those who ask in faith. Do you truly want to know? If you do not understand God's view of life, keep on asking him to enable you to understand. He says he will, and he is a promise keeper. Wisdom is seeing life realistically from God's perspective. Hard stuff. Trials and troubles. They're not new. They're not just new to you and I. They are as old as the creation of man. The Israelites. The Israelites were living in Egypt. You know their story. Their life, by my definition, was completely miserable. It was full of troubles. Troubles and trials that they had no control over. Nor did they have the ability to fix on their own. Come with me. To Genesis 3 verse 7, where we see God saying, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying, so I have come down to rescue them. Who is he talking to? Let's look back at the account together. Moses, Moses is in the field. And what does he see? But a burning, dip, burning bush. And he thought, it says in scripture, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up, burn up. So he goes over. Although there were flames, the bush was still standing. A strange sight? Yep, I'm thinking so. Then something crazier happens. From this bush, God calls out to Moses, and Moses replies, Here I am. And God goes on to say, Do not come any closer. Take off your sandals, for the place you are standing on is holy ground. Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God, a holy, majestic God, who I would like to point out is calling his man Moses by name. We could just stop here and spend well-deserved time on this beautiful, rich passage, but that will be for another day. But for today, we are moving forward, and we quickly find out that God is going to send Moses as his representative, his messenger, his instrument to Egypt in order to, um, back to verse 8, rescue the people from the hand of the Egyptians and bring them out of the land and into good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. God was going to bring the people that he loved and he heard cry from trouble to peace. Now Moses, when we go back and we read and we look, we we see that he is concerned that the people of Israel would not listen to him and that they would not believe that God had sent him. So God responds. And I'm going to read it to you because I can do no justice just by telling you, and I, I need to read to you from, from Scripture. So Genesis 4, verse 2 to 7, and it says, So remember, Moses is at the burning bush, and God says, You are standing on holy ground. I have heard my people cry, and I am coming down to rescue them. And then Moses said, They won't believe me. Then the Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? A staff, he replied. The Lord said, Throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground, and it became a snake, and he ran from it. Then the Lord said to him, Reach out your hand and take it by the tail. So Moses reached out, took hold of the snake, and it turned back into a staff in his hand. This, said the Lord, is so that they might believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. Then the Lord said, Put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand in his cloak. And when he took it out, the skin was leprous. It had become as white as snow. Now put it back into your cloak, he said, God said. So Moses put his hand back in his cloak. And when he took it out, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. So Moses is obedient. 
after giving God some some grief he he didn't feel confident but but bottom line he went he went and he appeared to the people and moving forward Moses did exactly what God told him to do Moses and Aaron verse 29 Moses and Aaron brought together all the elders of the Israel elders of the Israelites and Moses told them everything the Lord had said to Moses he also performed the signs before the people and they believed him what signs the snake in the hand. They believed. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshipped. Now a miracle happens. And the people believe. The people see God in action and movement. And there was no denying that. Remember that. Remember that. Have you seen God in action in movement? in your life, in times of trouble, where you have not been able to deny it. Mark it down, write it down. Now Moses and Aaron next go to Pharaoh. And they go to Pharaoh to request that he let God's people go. And not only did Pharaoh say no, but he also ordered, we see in Exodus 5 verse 9, it says, make the work harder for the people. The Israelites were under the oppression of the Egyptians and what they were responsible for was making bricks. Now you needed straw in order to make bricks and, and the straw was provided by the Egyptians. But Pharaoh said, no longer provide it. They'll have to go get their own straw all the while maintaining the same quota. It's impossible. Can I bring you back to James 1 verse 2? Consider it pure joy, brothers and sisters, whenever you face many trials. Huh. It got worse. Now the Israelite overseers were beaten by the slave, driver, slave drivers, the Egyptians, when the quota was not met. The impossible quota was not met. These men, the overseers, then went to Pharaoh to speak to him about this injustice, about their troubles and their trials. It didn't go well. Read it there in Exodus. Pharaoh threw them out and he called them lazy. Lazy because apparently they have too much time to talk about, complain about, wanting to go and make sacrifices to their God. These men, the overseers, they knew their troubles were bad when they were told once again you are not to reduce the number of bricks Pharaoh told them once again you are not to reduce the number of bricks required of you each day and oh by the way you still have to go get your own straw James 1 verse 2 consider it pure joy what is God accomplishing through these troubles? What is going on? What is God accomplishing, accomplishing in your troubles? It is hard to see, isn't it? Leaving Pharaoh, these men found Moses and Aaron waiting, waiting for Aaron. Sorry, found Moses and Aaron waiting for them, and they said, "May the Lord look on you." and judge you. You have made us obnoxious to Pharaoh and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. And again I ask you, what on earth is God up to? In their life, in your life, Moses goes to God. And again, I can't do it justice. So come with me to Exodus 5 verse 22, starting at verse 22. Verse 22, Moses returned to the Lord and said, Why, Lord, have you brought trouble on these people? Is this why you sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he, brought, he has brought trouble on his people, and you have not rescued your people at all. But we have a but. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. 
Because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of his country. God also said to Moses, I am the Lord. God says to you, I am the Lord. He goes on to say, I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, and by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself fully known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, where they resided as foreigners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the Israelites, whom the Egyptians have, uh, are enslaving, and I have remembered my covenant. Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with a mighty act of judgment. And I will take you as my own people and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. And there we have it. Now, Moses does go tell the people this, um, but they are discouraged by their situation and the hard labor that continues. But I want to remind you that God is on the move. I want to remind you that things are not always as they seem. God directs Moses and Aaron, and they do all that God tells them to do. When God directs you, do you do all that he directs you to do? There's plagues. God steps in. There is the plague of the Nile being turned into blood. There's frogs, gnats, flies. There's the plague of the livestock, livestock dying. And this happened for the Egyptians only, not the Israelites. The Israelites can see that God is on the move. There were boils, hail, locusts, darkness, and then there's the big one. There's the big plague, the plague of the firstborn. And we see that in Exodus 11, verse 4 to 8. And I ask you to be patient as we just work through this a little bit here. So Moses said, and he's talking to Pharaoh, This is what the Lord says, About midnight I will go throughout Egypt. Every firstborn son in Egypt will die. From the firstborn son of Pharaoh, who sits on the throne, to the firstborn son of the female slave, who is at her handmill, and all the firstborn of the cattle as well. There will be loud wailing throughout Egypt, worse than there has ever or ever will be again. But among the Israelites, not a dog will bark at any person or animal. And then you will know that the Lord makes a distinction between Israel and Egypt. Moving forward, we know that the plague comes, but there is a great big but. And we see that but in verse 12, or chapter 12, verse, um, verse 12 to 14. On that same night... The plague has come. I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals. And I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. There's the but. The blood for the Israelites will be a sign for you on the house where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Again, we could stop here and spend well-deserved hours looking at the Passover. But we need to do that on another day. For today, I want to let you know, I want to remind you, I want to retell the story of the people being let go. Trials and troubles were very real to these people. This group, really no different than you or I. These individuals, each one of them, step out of the bondage under the hand of the Egyptians and begin to walk, uh, walk, begin a walk of faith with God. What troubles you? Are you under a heavy burden? Look back at this group of people. Close your eyes. Will you close them and see them? Each of them. Look at them. Know their trouble is very real. 
their pain, their suffering, their bewilderment, their discouragement. And there was actually no end in sight for them because they were blinded by their very situation. Um, Exodus 6 verse 9 says, Now open your eyes and look square in the face of what is troubling you. I acknowledge with you that it is very real, very real, very difficult. And will you come back with me to James 1 verse 2 where it says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Trials, troubles, work for believers, not against them. Now, just because this is hard truth does not mean that it's not truth. Patience, endurance will lead us to a place where we can keep going even when things get tough. In the Bible, patience is not a passive acceptance of of circumstances. No, it's courageous perseverance in the face of suffering and difficulty. We desperately, desperately need wisdom So we will not waste the opportunity God is giving us to mature. The whole book, uh, the whole first chapter of one of James deals with dealing with trials of many kinds. Go back to the children of Israel. Look at their story, their reality. Close your eyes once again and envision them. Living life and it's hard. Their labor is backbreaking. They have little. They are shown no compassion. They are abused. They are tired. They are even beaten both physically and mentally. They seem forgotten, unimportant. James 1 verse 2. Consider it pure joy. What is God up to? What is God accomplishing in and through them, in and through you? They are crying out to God and he hears them and he is on the move to rescue them and give them a life that is a life that is life to the full. And yet, at first, they suffer more. They are worked harder. They are beaten more and treated even worse than they were before, if that even seems possible. Now we have the gift and it's a gift of being able to look back at the whole story and be reminded of God's faithfulness in order that we can move forward in hope. I ask you, who is looking and watching your story unfold? Will we be able, or will they be able, to look back when needed, and it will be needed? And will they be reminded in order to move forward in hope when they look at you moving through the trials and troubles of your life? In the walk of faith that these people are about to enter into with God through the wilderness until they reach the promised land, they will most definitely at a basic level need stamina, resilience, strength, both mentally and physically. Under the heavy burden of the trials they faced in Egypt, God definitely built this into their character. The question is, were they willing to use it in the tomorrows of their troubles and trials? Has God taught you stamina, resilience, and strength both physically and mentally in yesterday's trouble? Do you consider it pure joy what you have been taught? So you can be mature and complete, lacking nothing in tomorrow's storms. Will you use what he has taught you yesterday? At the most important level, the Israelites were shown that their faithful God was faithful. He heard their cry. He answered. He came. He rescued. He gave life by saving life through the Passover lamb. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. He moved on their behalf in marvelous and miraculous ways. They witnessed it. There was no denying it. On their new journey of faith, through the wilderness, to the promised land, would they remember what they saw in God and from God? 
and would they rely on the truth he displayed about himself and have patient endurance, stand firm in the storms they would hit in the desert they were about to walk through on their way to the promised land. Read the story and be reminded, sometimes yes and sometimes no. On our journey of faith, through this life, which I I think I can call wilderness because there are wilderness moments. Until we come into the promised land, will you count it pure joy, the different trials and troubles you have had to go to, go through, you are going to go through, and remember all that God has and will accomplish in and through them. Will you count it joy, how he has revealed himself to you, how he has shown himself faithful to you, Once again, will you close your eyes with me and will you go back to the Exodus? I'd like to fast forward you to the time where the people have left the land. So much has happened, but I'm just bringing you to this point and stand with me here with these people at the Red Sea. Remember what they have gone through for years, for years, and what they have seen all of it, the hard, but also the moving of God in their lives before they even knew he was moving and when it seemed like he was not moving and when they saw his hand of mercy on their lives. There we stand with them. Look back and we can see with them the horrible oppressive Egyptians changing their mind and saying, no, we want you back. We want to kill you, actually, coming after them in order to destroy and kill. Now look forward with them and see the impassable Red Sea. Now the general population, we read, crumbled. And quite frankly, I get it. I get it. But Moses, Moses here sets the example. Look back and be reminded What's coming at you? What threatens to undo you, destroy you, suck the light out of you, discourage you, or cause you to fear? Be reminded so you can move forward in hope. Moses went to God. He knew who to go to. He stood in patient endurance as he looked to God and he moved at God's command. He had had eyes to see this once again huge trouble through the lenses of God. Moses' faith had been tested and would be tested again and again and again, and so will yours. Today, he is at the Red Sea. Moses' faith was mature and lacking nothing this time. Exodus 14, verse 6, verse 16 says, As the people look back and they look forward, God speaks to Moses and says, Raise your staff and stretch your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. You know the story. Moses and the people move forward in hope. These passages in Exodus are rich and in no way at all do I want to take away any of the value found in them. There is so much to be learned by looking back and retelling the story. And I encourage you to take the time to reread the account and to watch our faithful God move in mighty ways. But if you will for today, can I bring it back to a very basic thought that I've had in regards to the Israelites, Moses, the Egyptians, and walking through this life with troubles. I love this story. Their story is really no different than yours or mine. There are different times, yes, and different cultures, yes, and because of these things there are different problems and there are different troubles, but it's the same God. I love the gift. It's a gift of the account of this story. It helps me 
and hopefully you tremendously with James 1 verse 2 where it says consider it pure joy my brothers and sisters whenever you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance that perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete lacking nothing and let me remind you we do not need to face troubles on our own more importantly in our own understanding in regards to James 1 verse 2 we have a promise from the promise keeper if you lack wisdom if you lack the ability to see this from God's perspective you should ask God who gives generously to all with finding fault fault are you standing at a place where you see the trouble of the Egyptians coming after you and the Red Sea before you? I ask you to look up. Choose to live in the confidence that God is right there, present, working, available at all times, all places, all circumstances. Will we crumble or Will we, be, will we be reminded of God's faithfulness, His working in and through us to transform us into who, ha, who He has created us to be? And then, my friends, walk through the Red Sea bravely with patient endurance. Walk forward, my friend. Consider it pure joy. Amen.